Hey everyone, I'm Chris Lesniak. And I'm Rob Beyer. And this is the Debate Math Podcast. Debating mathy topics and mathy pedagogy with mathy people just like you. Let's get into this month's debate. So, math exams, the typical culminating assessment at the end of a unit or end of a semester. But what if we didn't give exams at all? What if instead we spent that time on an alternative form of assessment? But what is the best way forward? So we're going to explore that today and here to talk about their favorite way to assess students in an alternative way. We have three awesome educators. And first up is a longtime educator, founder and director of Coding with Culture, a step and cheer coach whose father was a computer scientist, Coach Victor Hicks. Hi, Coach Hicks. Hello, hello. How are you guys? Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Glad to have you here. Can you tell us where you are and what your current role is? So I am currently in Atlanta, Georgia, um, by way of Chicago, Illinois. Decided this year to take a leap of faith, um, still in the education realm, but doing it through the independent consultation role. So we're partnering with the wonderful uh, All Girls STEM Academy here in Atlanta um, and doing all the things, you know, loving it. Um, no snow. So I, I'm happy to be away from Chicago, but, um, you know, still living the whole HBCU dream. That's what brought me to Atlanta from Chicago. And thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for being here. And the question we ask all of our guests is when did math first become controversial to you? Probably upon birth. So I'm actually all, uh, you know, all gloves off. I am a product of not only a computer scientist, but my mom is a 32-year math veteran. And so um, her being a uh, one of the co-authors of the Chicago Algebra Project, um, doing a lot of work around culturally relevant mathematics, um, I think it was always controversial in a good way. So my mom did all of the things, like all the buzzwords before they were things. You know, she had 35 kids. She she taught through the, you know, single gender. We're going to have, you know, eight kids in the class, 35 in the class, you know. But uh, the thing of it was, was that um, consistently around parochial and public school, she, you know, her kids learned math. So I think for me, uh, math was always controversial in a way, more of like a, almost kind of like a challenge. So not in a bad way but always in a way of, you know, really pushing kids towards that that problem solving and that really looking at how to, you know, all the different good practices of math. So it was always controversial to me in a good way because my mom was, yeah, Mama Hicks was old school. So <laughs> math was always a controversial topic in a good way in my house. Wow. Thanks, Coach. Uh, next up is father of two, mathematics teacher, creator of professional development learning experiences, and a Socratic midwife who memorized Euclid's first book of elements and was taught to use Socratic exploration to explore dreams, Joshua Beam. Hi, Joshua. Hey there. Hey, welcome. And uh, could you let us know where you are and what your current role is? I am in Huntington Beach, California, enjoying lovely spring break here as the sun comes out. And I'm a mathematics teacher. This year I teach AP Calculus and a brand new class called Data Science. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, the first question that we ask all of our guests is, when did math first become controversial to you? Uh, I believe it was when I was reading in Plato's Mino that the word mathematics meant learning. And so it completely just hit me like a thunderbolt that it was obvious and that it had nothing to do with the numbers or the shapes, but it really had to do with what it drew the learner through, that it taught them about learning and themselves and trained all the highest skills. And at that moment, like, Everything changed. Assessment changed. Instruction changed. My way I, the way I gave points or didn't give points, everything changed. Uh, my whole attitude, it was no longer this like achievement based thing, but more about like, I, it was my job to train them to learn. And that's all I was there to do. And then all the rest of that stuff fell by the wayside. It was like clarity. And so now that's kind of a uh, divisive, that, that attitude is very divisive that the, that it, Everything should be about learning. It it ruffles a lot of old school teachers' feathers pretty negatively. Yes, I can see that. Thank you. Arguing along with these two educators is a returning guest here, a 25-year veteran teacher, vice president of programs for the Greater San Diego Math Council, and author of a chapter in the recent NCTM publication, Success Stories for Catalyzing Change in School Mathematics, 
Nolan Fossil. Hi, Nolan. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. Glad to have you here. Can you let us know where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, I live in San Diego County and teach in the Grossmont Union High School District, also in East San Diego County. I'm at Mount Miguel High School. I'm teaching Integrated Math 2 and Integrated Math 3. Good. And the question we asked you last time, and we'll ask it again, when did math first become controversial to you? All right. So more recently, I've realized my earliest sort of classroom memory around mathematics, or at least one of them, and I have very few that have persisted with me over the years, has to do with a teacher who would give us exit to recess by fast retrieval of math facts. And I always come back to this experience and this one particular guy who was always the one who was the fastest. No one could beat him. I could never beat him or come close. And I didn't realize that it was something that sort of lived in me until recently, quite recently, when I was reflecting on how frequently I think about that experience. So it's controversial to me in the so far as I didn't really recognize the lingering effects of thinking about how I was never measuring up to this ideal standard of fast retrieval or recall or calculation. Um, and then thinking, you know, more recently also about the number of students who probably um, felt like they had no access to that or it didn't speak to them or it didn't appeal to them. And, and maybe that was something that completely um, threw them away from thinking mathematics was for them. Thank you for sharing that. And with that, let's get into the debate. We begin with opening statements from each of our speakers. You each have two minutes to present your arguments. Coach Hicks, you're up first. You have two minutes and your time begins now. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Coach Hicks, Victor Hicks, and I'm here to talk a little bit about project-based learning. This innovative approach to education engages students in hands-on real-world learning experiences that are both meaningful and authentic. Project-based learning is not just about acquiring knowledge, but also about demonstrating that knowledge. This approach to learning provides a unique opportunity for assessment. Instead of just taking a test, scholars can showcase what they have learned by creating a product, presenting a solution to a real-world problem, or engaging in a performance. Through project-based learning, students are assessed not only on their knowledge and skills, but also on their ability to work collaboratively, think critically, and communicate effectively. These are essential skills for success in today's world, and project-based learning provides a way to assess and develop these skills. At all levels of education, project-based learning can be used to assess students' progress and achievement. At the primary level, students can showcase their learning through a visual presentation or performance. In the intermediate and middle school years, students can present their work to their peers and receive feedback. And at the high school level, students can engage in more complex and in-depth projects that demonstrate their mastery of a subject. So as we discuss assessment this evening, I invite you to embrace project-based learning as a way to create a more engaging, authentic, and effective means of assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. And next, we will hear from Joshua. Joshua, you have two minutes, and your time begins now. Thank you very much. Um, my claim is that engaging in interviews is the best way to alternatively assess students' understanding. For this, I have three warrants. My first warrant is that the interview process is the only method that gives the teacher a true, living, reliable expression of what the student understands. All other forms of assessment are secondhand images of what the student understands. With the availability of software such as Photomath, Mathway, and Symbolab, once an assessment occurs outside the confines of the class, a teacher cannot guarantee the work that reflects the, understand, that reflects the student's understanding. Face-to-face -face interviews ensure that a student will be sharing their own understanding. My second word is that face-to-face -face assessment is the most flexible and thus most equitable method for assessing students. By asking students a baseline set of open-ended questions, a teacher can use both the content and habits of mind standards to assess students. With this baseline measure, a teacher can adapt to the idiosyncratic skills of each student and then ask questions appropriate to each student. Equitable teaching requires that the educator learn about what each student brings to the class. The open-ended nature of the interview process best allows the teacher to discover this data. While portfolios and projects can be written in an open-ended manner that allows for student input, by the student engaging with the teacher, the student engages the person with the knowledge of how to best help them grow. And this leads to my final warrant. 
which is to say that the interview process is an intentional step to forming a strong student-teacher relationship. By incorporating scheduled dialogues between students and teachers, interviews create the conditions for the learning relationship to happen. A teacher's sole focus is to nurture students through the learning process, and interviews allow for this nurture to happen most effectively and directly. Thank you, Joshua. And finally, we will hear from Nolan. Nolan, you have two minutes, and your time begins now. Odds are, if you're tuning into this podcast episode, you already have strong feelings about grading practices. You probably recognize that grades simultaneously distract students from learning and are used to perpetuate a system that was designed to exclude and marginalize many students. It chances are, if you're already nodding your head at these problematic aspects of grading, you also know that traditional assessment practices are part of the problem. I'm not arguing there's no place for traditional skill-based tests, but I am saying that the information we gather from these instruments is at best extremely limited. In all honesty, it's really difficult to have an asset-focused perspective on student work when grading against an answer key. Couple this with the fact that most of us are using gradebook categories where tests and quizzes receive the largest share of attention, and we have a real student assessment crisis. My claim is that portfolios provide a wonderful mode to assess the richness of student thinking learning, and growth. I have several warrants for this claim. First, portfolios open teachers' eyes to better recognize students' strengths and genius. They do this by changing the dynamic of interaction between teacher and student, lowering the affective filter for students, and opening a window into student thinking in a way that traditional assessment instruments fail to do. Second, portfolios foster a culture of rough draft thinking, revision, and revisitation. The learning doesn't have to stop just because the test has come and gone. Additionally, portfolios accommodate students' individual needs for pacing that meets them where they are. Further, students may look back at their portfolio entries over the course of a semester or year to see how much they've grown, review key ideas, and draw connections. Third, portfolios provide assessment without the baggage of letter grades and percentages. And finally, for those fans of Dr. Goldie Muhammad's work, Portfolios provide a space for teachers to ensure that our assessment of students includes the pursuits of identity, intellect, criticality, and joy, in addition to skills. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you, Nolan, and thank you, all three of you. Wow, we're off to a good start here, digging in uh, deeply into uh, grading and assessment and all that and how they're all intertwined. Um, I think I before I, I have a lot of questions I want to ask about your kind of style and things, but can we back up and just, like, how... What do you define as assessment or what is like the word assessment mean to you? You could just go back to the line one more time, starting with, with Coach Hicks. And... Well, it's interesting because for all of my esteemed uh, colleagues, I think that, you know, looking at the project-based learning, what they spoke about, um, one of the things that struck me immediately was the commonality in what we talk about. So we look at, I think, at the Venn diagram of our conversations, what both gentlemen talked about are the assessment pieces of what I do. So like when we look at, you know, our design of HBCU project, the kids have to do a, you know, portfolio, whether it be digital or how do you know, how do you present this, you know, as the H, you know, this college recruiting officer, how do you present this campus? So that's the portfolio piece. How does your coding come into that? How do we communicate, you know, how we use the design thinking process? And then with the interview, the interview piece, totally speaks to it because the second part of my, most of my kids, you know, project-based learning thing is, okay, now we need to communicate about this compu computational thinking. How did you do this? You know, talk to me about now that we have this product, you know, what were the, what were the pieces? So I think to me, I mean, and I don't, I mean, just speaking kind of just from the vibe I got immediately was like, though, I think it all kind of works hand in hand. Those are actually the assessment pieces that I use in my project-based learning units to demonstrate understanding. Cause I think the the caveat of my piece is that you have to make sure that there's those tangible pieces because projects can get lost. It gets kind of lost in that field trip, you know, mindset. So you have to have the interviews, you have to have the portfolios because those are the things that you can show and say, okay, this is the, here's the meat and potatoes. Here's my, you know, check boxes to those objectives of those standards, you know, that I'm, I'm looking at alternatively. So I think all three. I, I have evolved to that, but let me first give a chance for Josh okay, and Nolan to weigh in. No, I, have, I have more. I want to say something like that, but let me first give them a chance to weigh in on how, what do you define as assessment or how do you define assessment? Well, first of all, thank you very much. That was, I do see the Venn diagram of all three. I, they, I, they have to kind of work in cohort with one another. Um, 
I think for me, this always raises a question of what is assessment, you know, like, um, and, and what are we doing when we're assessing? And like, so part of mathematics is performative. They do need to execute equations. They do need to solve. They have that to need to attend precision. But then again, there is another aspect that I like the rough draft aspect of assessment, which is, are we really asking them to demonstrate a whole mathematical way of being, which has rough drafts and edits and has final drafts. So uh, for me, a lot of my assessment in the class comes from, I'm walking up to the whiteboard, the students are at the board. I have in my mind the math content, I have the habits of mind, and I'm just seeing if they check those boxes. And if they are, or if they're not, then I need to develop a lesson that either builds upon the boxes they've already checked or addresses the ones that they're not. That includes, you know, collaborating with others, sharing different ways of expressing, being brave. So uh, for me, it comes to that. There's like an ideal. There is a mathematical ideal that I kind of have in my mind. And I just want to, I'm all constantly judging them. What are, what's their process on that? So that's the assessment part. The interview part comes from them speaking their mind because I know like I can see certain skills from them uh, on the outside, but when they interview, they're presenting themselves and their ideas. So then I get a lot of self-assessment. I can see how, how much can they see of their own skill? Because as a coach or as a math teacher, I can see what skills they're demonstrating, but as they're coming into themselves and their own mathematical identity, they might not be able to see that. And so in the interview process, I can actually help them to see, see that part of themselves. And so that's the aspect why I really like about the interviews. So and no one? Yeah, yeah, I agree with so much of what both of these gentlemen have said. Um, one of the things that's in my brain is that it's really difficult uh, for us and our experience as teachers, at least from my own perspective and from conversations I've had, to separate our intentions of assessment as seeing where students are and what support they need from the aspects of something to put in the grade book. And I feel like too much of our assessment isn't really about assessment. It's not about a connection with students to see where they're at and how we can support. It's about a record of evidence that we can put so we can justify a grade that's in the grade book. And with that focus that seems overwhelming, it feels like we lose that connection with students. Students feel like assessment is something done to them, not done with them. And I just feel like there's so much emphasis on, well, I need to have evidence. I need to justify this grade. When someone comes to ask me, I need to know. And it just feels really uh, confrontational in that way. So I think that an aspect of trying to differentiate, or I should say separate in any way we can the evaluation part of our obligation from the teaching aspects and the building community aspects is, is something that we can really um, seek to bolster in our assessment practice. So I, I'm, both Jocko and, and Coach Hitchie brought up the Venn diagram, like you're both talking about doing some sort of like project D interviews type thing as your way of assessing where students are or, or, or just how to grade them in some sense too or something. So I'm just wondering what the difference kind of is and like tease out a little bit of the difference here so like Koshik, so what is it you're grading students on because you you have kind of a portfolio embedded in your project and you have interviews happening along the way right you're checking in with them but like are you grading them on each of those different things or is it just the final product you know it's interesting so i'm actually as i was signing on today i'm working on um kind of editing or iterating one of my units and so trying to get myself more into um just some kind of looking at Blows and grows of the, like the project based learning piece. Um, I was having kids that were struggling because I didn't, I was actually uh, to, you know, piggyback on what Brother Nolan was saying, like I didn't want it to become too, you know, quiz test based where the kids were kind of getting used to this because I, I was really intentional about this learning environment. And so the, the, the sacrifice of that was I had kids that were like, yeah, I really can't manage you're not saying anything to me until, you know, week five, because I'm used to, I need some type of, so I think it's just really looking at, um, I guess being intentional. So, you know, really looking at those projects. Um, and then once you kind of break it down into the week, so, and again, you know, use my, um, you know, the methods of my colleagues. So if that interview is taking place, that, that will kind of be like my evaluate steps. So looking at the five E's, that would be at the end. So that would probably be one of the things I would weigh a little bit heavier because you've kind of been through the process. Um, as far as the checks and balances, that portfolio piece. So uh, our kids build their Google site, excuse me, their HBCU through their a Google site. So each week there's like a smaller 
less risk, I guess, piece um, where kids can, you know, but again, that's more regular. So my kids that might struggle in those larger, you know, at the end product, you might be like, okay, well, you know, baby, you tried. I'm, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> you know, but they also, but they were all, they were able to experience the success because unfortunately, you know, the, the, the gray book and the, the weighty and all that kind of stuff is beyond my, beyond my grade. So trying to figure out ways. So I give, I try to have been more intentional, even as in the process of giving them more, of giving them smaller tasks where it's not as much right or wrong. So, hey, did you, you know, did you create a logo? What, you know, did you learn about, did you create the, you know, did you watch the video that talked about, you know, graphic design? And so a little bit of both. I just think where it kind of fits in. And it, I mean, even with the interview process. So um, there's classes. I use that a little bit with my younger kids just so they're, uh, I use Flipgrid a lot for the interview process. So that way, even the kids are kind of shy out a little bit. So uh, to give you kind of a numerical value, each video could be worth five points. So even if you totally bomb out on the Minecraft, whatever the final prototyping piece is, if you've been doing that interview piece, if you can communicate that, you know, your computational thinking, you know, you're, you're still going to experience some kind of success. Because that's really, it's like the soft skills you want to take away. So it's that gray line between grading them, but also using that grading to, you know, not beat them down and also cultivate the, the you know, the support that we want them to have. So, yeah. Yep. It's just, it's, 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 it's a, it literally every year and, it, and you have to be, I hate to use the buzzword differentiation, but I guess every group of kids, because even two second grade, first quarter, the second quarter, like I have one group of kids where the interview process was heavy because those are my talkers. Now, if I looked at the coding, God bless them, <laughs> but they could talk, you know, so, I, so flip grid was heavy. So like their big thing was their presentations and their commercials. So like I had to kind of weigh it a little bit heavier so they would, you know, be validated in those skills. So it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a ebb and flow. And then Joshua, same thing. So what is it you're grading if you're doing interviews? Like, is there a written thing there they're handing in or is it you like a rubric while they're talking to you? Or what, what is it you're imagining here? Well, I have three different practices. One is just the informal practice of them talking to each other and me walking up and talking to them at the whiteboard. That's very much, I keep notes on that. I do the building thinking classrooms model in that way. I'm writing down little instructions. The second one is I have them perform a more Socratic sort of preparation to be asked questions. And then the last one, I give them an actual, like, we're going to discuss like applications of integrals questions. And I'm going to ask that you demonstrate understanding the patterns of solving the questions through the, uh, using the methods, how to represent these visually, how to explain the properties. I'm going to look for you to communicate these ideas and the justifications for me. And so it's laid out for them. They, I like the idea of having them practice this year. I, I went to a CMC session about video responses. And so I incorporated it in my class and using Flipgrid, they can submit theirs and then I can read them. Excuse me. The actual interview process is my favorite though, because then I always get to adapt. Like if kids have lower skills, I can ask them questions that can see if they can build to the end. Kids that have higher end skills, I can ask more kind of like open-ended questions like, well, what do you see between this question and, the sim and other similar questions? And so it, it opens up very much there. I'm looking for those basics though. Can you like, they know the kinds of questions that are coming. Can you, they've seen them before. Can you talk to me about them? Can you explain them? Can you represent them visually? You know, can you communicate the, the proper properties that you're using to justify your steps? It's kind of like classic AP calculus prep. And so, and then I give them a response. The cool thing about this is, is it's a, it's a dialogue. So there's no period at the end. It's like, if they're, if they didn't do something, I could be like, okay, I'm looking for you to strengthen these skills. You know, like right now you're not demonstrating the, the most clarity that you can, or the fullest understanding. You can go these more levels. And I tell them, and then I'm like, if you like, let's talk again about it. And then they can just always show up and talk again. And like, keep a little record of it, you know? Like I don't actually have grades in the calculus class, but I have a spreadsheet and I mark in the spreadsheet about different students. And what's really cool about the interview process is like, so when they take an exam, I have to score them. They have to know the number they're going to get for the AP test. There's a number that you either get this number, or you get a three or four or five and they want to pass. So I give them the scores and then I'll be 
I'll hand it back to them. I'll say like, well, what do you notice? Like, oh, I, I see that I should do this. I'm like, what do you mean? And then they'll explain it to me and I'll just change the score <laughs> right on the exam. They're like, what? How'd you do that? I was like, well, you, you did understand it, right? I didn't tell you. And they're like, yeah, I did. I was like, looks good to me then. And then we just move on. And so um, that's kind of the, the main way that I use as the assessment part of it is those three different methods. Yeah. Right. I say here, I go a lot of what Coach Hicks was saying, like a lot of similar ideas and sentiments there. And no one, I'm sure you play similar things. Uh, but I'm curious, like in the portfolio, like are you grading things all along the way? Or like, is the final product the only thing that gets graded? Like how does it work in a portfolio style? Yeah, I don't um, maintain a grade book at the moment. And I have the privilege and luxury to not do so um, and I haven't caught any flack from it. And this year I haven't even had uh, inquiries, I would say, from from parents or family members asking about it. Um, but generally, um, you know, I have some things to tighten up for sure. That's not exactly where I need it to be or want it to be. But uh, I can at least say that I've been comfortable with the fact that um, the assessment's happening all the time. So maybe today is something like a formal um, assessment prompt that or that's going into their portfolio. And another day I had a kid who was out for two weeks. Maybe they had COVID or maybe they were visiting family or maybe who knows what, they just missed school. So when they come back, we can use the portfolio and talk about a couple of things I'd like to see in there or some things maybe that they weren't there for. And I can give them access to some um, videos to watch or some other questions to answer. So in the same way, it kind of functions like an interview. It can function in a project sort of way. Um, it just sort of becomes like a written space for students to do that, to communicate about it. And um, I'd love to hear more from Joshua about uh, the logistics of the interviews. Like, how are you doing it in your class sizes as being as they are? Um, so I know the part of it that's informal, that's just, they're doing an activity and you're walking and walking. I'm sure part of that is part of your interviewing assessment. Um, but if there's aspects of it that are more formal, like how are you fitting it in? So I find that I have more entries than I have time to give feedback to. Um, but I can also use that to sort of, well, some things I'm doing and some things I'm projecting to do in the future is have more peer interaction for feedback in them or survey them and picking a couple of main themes to offer as generic feedback for others. Um, you know, so there's different ways to go about it, but I'm still trying to figure all that out. Uh, but to, back to your original question, nothing gets a, a mark or a score during any part of this process because I want to keep this as authentic and part of the identity building, especially in a high school classroom where they may not necessarily have had experiences to build identity and work on improving agency previous to this. It's really to separate the idea of I did this, now what's my grade on it? So, you know, part of what we do with the podcast here is is talking with teachers and hearing what like teachers have to say. And oftentimes whenever I, I bring up um, alternative assessments, I, the question is always, well, how does this compare to traditional assessment? Where do traditional assessments fit into your model? Um, do they fit in? Is there a place for traditional assessments within what your, you know, your approach? And I'm actually going to start with Nolan. And then uh, we'll go to coach after that. Yeah, I suspect um, everyone here will have a similar perspective because they've already heard it in the things that everybody has been saying. Um, but so much of students' experiences, they come in to take a traditional test and they're ready or they're not, or they thought they were prepared and they thought the questions didn't match what they were prepared for. Um, and then it's sort of like, it's the end of it. I got a mark. It's not a good mark or it's a good mark or, or I feel good. I feel bad. But it, we move on from there. Um, and that has just so many damaging effects in terms of of how students feel they're preparing for it, how they feel about themselves as a learner of mathematics, for instance, um, based on those results. It has so little to do with what they actually know. I think we also overvalue that we're good at writing good tests. I've never had a course in it. I think I write good ones. I look back at ones I thought were the best, and now I'm like, well, there's some problems there. And I just generally think that we don't necessarily have the time, and we certainly don't have the training to know if we're writing really good questions that are actually getting to what students really know. Um, so one aspect to where I'll use what looks like a traditional assessment is give it, it can mark it, but it doesn't have to have a score that gets reported. And just by removing the idea of recording or reporting a score on it, now it becomes something we can use as the basis for uh, an entry in a portfolio. Now the entry isn't so much um, just the score that's in a grade book, but it's a reflection from the student on the things that they clearly understood from it, the things where they clearly have gaps, the things where they need to revisit, all those kinds of things. And so it's like, hey, you blew it on a test. It's not a bad grade. And now you're done. It's like, hey, 
you didn't do very well in the skills assessment. So let's talk about how to bolster those skills. Let's talk about math practices. Let's talk about habits. Let's talk about other things we need to, to, to show that we can make growth from this place. I'm going to go to coach. And then Joshua after that coach, same question. So I think for me, it's just, I, I totally love that answer. I think, you know, really being intentional about um, you know, setting that culture in your classroom. You know, I think one of the things I always tell, I, I love about teaching outside of the core class area is that I really get to focus on, you know, good pedagogy. And so, you know, even with my students being intentional of saying to them, of course, you know, teaching all the grade levels, having to kind of, you know, tailor that message a little bit, but in telling them, you know, but I think kids respect, kids are very good judges of um, intentionality. And, and and where you're coming from. So if you're really just trying to get them to pass the test, they know. They may not be able to tell you they know, but you'll see in the way that they move. So for my kids, you know, it comes down to, and again, that it, it came from a really a, that, that iterative process of saying, okay, you know, I want the kids to be able to get this. So, hey, even when I'm introducing my centers, I know that, you know, if you struggled in this, in this question, you know, if we're talking about, you know, you know, setting a variable or creating a variable in a, in a computer science project and you struggled on that assessment question, you're in group one. So whatever that hands on activity, it's no, you know, it's it literally for that learning. It's going back to that, that educational process. And I think all the things that I loved about even looking at how we can, you know, make that assessment authentic is that we look at, you know, design thinking, you know, what do we really want question? What do we really want kids to be able to take away from this? You know, when we look at our current system of education, that was to provide kids or excuse me, to prepare kids for the industrial revolution. We're coming out of the one room farmhouse into these factories where you had to be able to perform these tasks that were repetitive, you know, but we're in the information age now. How often are kids going to be required to regurgitate the answer to a question. We need to think, we need them to think about, you know, and again, how we do it, you know, how do I can continue to provide evidence? So again, if we take that assessment question and break it into that portfolio. So if I'm struggling on, you know, and I mean, I'll take it out of the computer science realm, you know, understanding, you know, government, my student portfolio needs to show, here's some evidence of me being able, of showing growth over how of understanding this concept. You know, we bring in the interview process. So I think, I mean, I think it's we really have to be radical in looking at how, you know, being completely understanding of the, because again, we, right, we don't pay, we're not the superintendent, so we, <laughs> we don't make the big bucks. So, you know, figuring out how to tailor it within that process as hopefully thinking optimistically we're growing out of that, but also not beating kids down and, you know, developing a anxiety about learning. And definitely, I think we talk about computational, anything computational, math, anything, you know, transactional science is that is the mentality that comes along with that. So even in that in that process, in that pedagogy, you know, we have to be intentional because even if the concepts are understood, if we're creating these the this culture of anxiety or I can't or, you know, and I think sometimes that that test of right or wrong where this kid who, who I'm sure all the three things that we're saying could be brilliant and could demonstrate understanding be all compare, but will bomb on a test every single time. But again, when he goes out to work for Google or Microsoft or, you know, Amazon, are we really going to be asking him to fill out a test? Like, when is he ever going to, but he is going to have to be able to interview and communicate his thinking. He is going to be have to be able to create this, which they totally may be able to do. So it's like, you know, but I don't know. I'm going to get off my soapbox. That would be a whole different. <laughs> we'll be on here all night. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to give Joshua a chance to, to answer the same question too. Go ahead, Joshua. I, I think what I really appreciate about my colleagues here is the, you know, the idea of using assessment to help build identity and especially not damage identity. You know, we have Nolan's story. I don't know, Nolan, if you were going out last every day or not. Now you're a math teacher, you know, something like that for, testing last and performing on the exams last. So it's just kind of terrible that that occurs. And we we see that we want to go outside of this. I always just come back to the fact that like, like if I'm teaching somebody to shoot in, in a bow and arrow and they're missing the mark, they have to know they've missed the mark. So that's just our assessment. Now, what we do with it emotionally after that is different. Like you have to perform skills. You have to demonstrate certain attitudes and states of mind. So the traditional test is valued by me and, and I value it in terms of like, even in my data science class, I, by the way, I'm learning to code and I stink at this. And, but I have to get this, the students have to do the programs. I got to do the programs. And 
So in the end, I think that's where the attitude about the assessment and what we do with the grading system really comes in. Because if it's just stagnant, you don't involve learning or growth, or you don't have a growth model, it built into your your grading system, then you you show them it doesn't matter. Cheat. Just take the shortcut. Make an appearance. So uh, I, I, I kind of want to value both sides of that. You know, like when the first day of AP Calculus, I asked the students, how many of you are here to learn calculus? And three out of the 25 raised their hand. And, and the next class was three out of 25. And I think they did it because they felt bad for me. <laughs> yes, they were all like, oh, they all just want to pass the test. They all just want the credit, right? You know, and so I have to also honor that and make sure they're preparing for that. The final thing about that is like on the AP test, 50% is a four out of a five. So it's humbling. So if we're just talking about performance and we're not talking about long-term growth and we're not talking building in models to reassess and have them generate that understanding as a whole, then they're never going to get there. They're going to they're gonna look at it and be like, 50%, I failed. They still do that no matter how many times I tell them. So I kind of like the assessment. I, I don't want us to get rid of that. If, if they have to produce a code or a web page and that web page doesn't come up and it says error, guess what? They were wrong and they need to be told that. And that's, we wouldn't want our doctors to not diagnose us correctly because of our feelings. You know, we'd want them to help us understand what the diagnosis was and then what are our next steps. And so in that way, um, I think it's important for them to get feedback. Now, the last part of this that really I'm still trying to work on as myself as a learner is how do I create those genuine self-reflection like moments with their exam? I have methods, I try them. I don't attach points to them. I still think they're faking them. So I want, how do we then, because it's without that self-reflection, any of our assessment and our good intentions don't lead. So how to build that into the assessment is kind of where I'm looking for. And so, and it's always the, always the word math that I, I come back to so often is it is my religious thing. I will preach to the that mathematics means learning. And so if you just assess them and it's dead, you're not really a math teacher. Like you're, <laughs> You got to allow that. You got to allow for some growth and some change. So, so I, I want to take my teacher hat off and put my administrative hat on for a follow up. So, how do these three different, you know, assessment alternatives prepare students for standardized tests? Because that's what we're, you know, we're, we're graded on in terms of the school. Uh, sometimes it's finance. Like, how are we preparing our students for standardized tests? I'm going to start. Joshua, I'm going to come right back to you, and then we'll go to Nolan and then Coach. All right, I'll, I'll change my perspective here too. <laughs> Come from the upside down world to speak to you about this because uh, I know I can I can do this speak well. I came from the, these schools. Uh, now, well, in one way, the interview process really addresses again that that strong teacher student relationship. So I get to address their content individually with them. It only takes five minutes at a time. Like a five minute interview is powerful to get a reflection on a certain concept. So in terms of preparing them for the exams, I can be much more precise in my direction for them. Again, as not all patients follow their doctor's orders, so too, not all students do, and that part's up to them. You know, like I have laid out for the students the, the recipe for passing the AP test. We have four weeks until the exam, like four weeks from today. There is a steps that can be taken. If they want to walk them, they, they can. And those that standards-based exam will reflect well if they walk on that path. And so the interview allows me to diagnose them better in that path. Uh, Nolan? Thanks, Mr. Rob, administration, man, um, for asking about this. I know that, that it's important to schools to see, their, to see the moves the teachers are making have an impact on standardized tasks. It's the wrong focus, quite honestly, but it's a focus. Um, but we're, we know a few things, like especially... In, in my particular case of teaching predominantly sophomores and juniors, if they're not engaged in the classroom experience, they're not learning, and that's going to be reflected in poor standardized test scores. Ways that we can engage students as learners are going to improve learners and them like their learning and therefore their learning outcomes, and that will also manifest. So one thing that I sort of see in all of the um, practices that are being described by our panel today is always to humanize and to personalize the learning journey. Always to bring the learner in and to always say we are learning from mistakes. We don't need to keep a strong record of mistakes, not in the way that Joshua was saying of like using them to point out areas for growth, but in saying like, oh, you blew it. Now you've got a ding. And after you get enough dings, like, of course, students are disengaging. They're checking out. And at that point, like, 
what you, what other methods, like how are traditional assessment practices at that point doing anything to benefit a student? Prepare them if they already feel like this isn't a space that's for me. But in what I'm seeing from all the conversation here is that the things we're doing are personalizing it. We're finding places to meet students where they are, to give them feedback, to help them grow, to help them see those soft skills. Not even a good name for it, right? Those are really important things besides the content, in addition to the content that create engaged, powerful students and thinkers and learners. And those are the people that are going to do their best, partly because of the connection that we can build with them um, for the sake of us, for the sake of the school, for the sake of their own pride. Um, you know, so I think that there's an avenue to address concerns about whether these alternative practices are helping students show growth. Of course they will. Like anything we're doing to build classroom community is going to have a positive outcome in every aspect. And that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of times we have to look at what are the benefits, you know, and again, I think that was a big part of me even going to coding the culture is that I wanted to, you know, be intentional about um, providing the the culture, because the thing is that regardless of whatever we are, you know, as, as much as data driven, and I think there's, you know, no shade to that. There's definitely, you know, merit to that. But these are also small, the smallest and most impressionable people that these things are happening to, these processes are happening to. So again, we have to look at, you know, what are the after effects and, and what do we need to be able to do to pad them and to prepare them for these situations? So again, is yes, we want them to be able to have these, these you know, standards-based things, but we also don't want them to come out of this, you know, a total hot mess. So how do we build them? How do you build the confidence? You know, how do we really build the, the things that once the standardized tests stop mattering, you know, those takeaways because there is some as murky as it may be <laughs> you know there is some life skill in that but i think you know it takes those opportunities so they cannot be it's not i don't think it's the either or i think you have to have both and i think you know those schools that work are the ones because like you said so much of, and i i love the fact that you framed it like that like that's beyond our reach we don't we as much as we could hate it i i do you know um but i I have to pay my bills. And I, so even as a consultant, I have to exist within this world of education as it exists. I have no intention to, I have no desire to be an administrator. So I know that that'll never be within my, you know, realm of even discussing. So it's like, how do I, within this, you know, knowledge base and, and, you know, I believe in pedagogy and what I feel is important in that computer science classroom, how do I take, you know, what these kids, so how do I build them up as much? So once they have to kind of go into this realm of whatever, you know, they have the confidence. And so even if they don't do the best on the standardized testing piece, they're confident in themselves enough as a critical thinker, as a problem solver to be able to say, this doesn't measure me. You know, this this is not an adequate piece of, I know, that, and again, I mean, will they be able to articulate that at eight? Probably not, you know, but I think when you build that, but that's why it's up to us as the adults to provide those pieces as much as it, as much as it may not be a tangible result, that's how you keep the kids going. Because my thing is, if I'm a critical thinker and I'll never do well on a test, unless I have a class where that critical thinking is somebody saying, this is awesome, I, this is amazing, this is amazing, this is amazing. You know, just think about the scope of an eight-year-old's day. When you walk out of that milestone test, you're coming into my classroom where I'm saying, hey, I don't care if you buy, look at what you're doing. You made this robot do this. You thought about this process. You failed, you kept going, you persevered. So as cliche as that may sound, I think that's how we help kids prepare for standardized testing because it is damage. I mean, you know, <laughs> let me not go on the record as saying that, but you know, I mean, when you think about some of those things that it, it unfortunately reinforces in our kids, we have to be our goal in that process because standardized testing is such a part of our culture is playing the, the role in that, being the band-aid, being the cheerleader, being the mentor, being the one that's saying, hey, you can get 95 questions wrong. You are still capable, you can do it. And there's in the real world, the gift that you have means so much more than this. So, you know, like I said, I think it's as cliche as it is that that's where we come in. It's, it's not the tangible pieces. It's not us, you know, doing the test prep. It's not us. And it's interesting. I didn't even say with my administrator, I'm like, I, this year, that was one of the things I stood by. Like, I don't want any, I don't want my kids to see me in that testing realm because going into my own business and providing this culturally relevant, sustainable computational business, I have to be that person that's not a part of that. Like, I don't, Coach Hicks has to be that person that's like, hey, you're creating this, you're a thinker, you're, you can feel everything. I mean, I shouldn't say, <laughs> you can feel everything, but this is going to be the place where I'm going to keep saying, yep, 
here's that here's that piece that we're going to hold on to. And this is this is why it's valid. And this is why we're going we're gonna to show you all the ways to be excellent in that. So, you know, we're 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 the we're the cheerleaders, I think, of the of the standardized testing piece. All right. And, and let me kind of follow up that was I, I want to think more about um, how to respond to naysayers. I, I, I'm in a more traditional school at the moment. I just think about some people who might say things like, you know, if it's not a like, t- you know, a test, this, this big official test, it's not uniform. It, there, it's um, it's not as rigorous. Right. Because they have some time to work on it on their own. And they could use the Internet or something or um they they need a test because that's what they're going to have in college is like exams all the time right so to prepare them for college so 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 just thinking how would you respond to a colleague or other teacher you interact with who's kind of a naysayer to we have to stick with tests because that's that's what's rigorous that's what colleges do like how do we help work with a colleague like that or adjust the needle on their thinking and i'll let anyone jump in on this first i i kind of ask myself who's who am i talking to uh, am I talking to a person who who is going to be open to listening to ideas or and maybe open to coming and seeing it in action? Uh, when I started doing the thinking classrooms model, my fellow mates in my department basically got on their phones. The oldest teacher in the department came by and watched it and started it. And now I was like, I get goosebumps when I do this. So I wouldn't waste my time on the other people in one way. So I know that sounds terrible, uh, but if they're open, then I would start to talk to them about like, well, what does it mean to demonstrate math understanding? You know, and what what are we doing when, when we're judging them in mathematics? Are we only judging them for performance or are we judging them for the habits of mind? If so, then if we're looking at these other habits of mind, then we have to assess them differently. Paper doesn't do that. How are you going to judge whether somebody persevered to a solution you know like you're not going to do that yeah how are you going to judge whether or not they can represent the math in multiple ways you know and use models like as you're you're not going to have that in a paper and pencil test and in that way that also just gets that one way of being mathematical when there are many other ways and so then i invite them i invite them to come see it in action like come like come watch it and then when they watch it they're like wow that was incredible like what the the relationship you just had with somebody, what you two talked about, how you spoke math to each other. They're like, wow, that was amazing. And I'm like, well, you could do that, too. Here's some steps. And so I try to try to have them look and not necessarily if they're open, criticize their way and tell them, oh, you're like you're just traditionalists and you have a closed mind. and <laughs> You're coming from your one limited prejudice way of viewing mathematics. Um but just ask them and invite them into that world. And those people that then come by, they get they get turned on, they see, and then they recognize like, wow, like I had some administrators come by and they were like, you're doing real education. You're really helping them to learn these executive skills. And I was like, oh, that must, that's good, I guess, you know? And so uh, they could see once they came into the class and observe, because I'm not here to proselytize and convince people to, evidence is in the learning experience that the students go through and so try to invite them in to see and nolan or coach Hicks, anything you want to add to that yeah i mean there's a lot of folks out there claiming the college works a certain way and the college monolithically is a certain way and people don't really know what happens in colleges these days unless you're in it right now you know, i imagine that what happens in a literature class is different than what happens in an anthropology class and that's different than what happens in a mathematics class is different than a physics class a computer science class. So there's no way for us to say that the way that I think I'm sustaining something that I'm calling rigor in my mathematics class is preparing them for the ubiquity of college. There's just no, that's a, that's a nonsense argument. So let's get to the fear of what it really is, right? What do they think that is missing? And I'm also going to challenge them on what they think they're capturing. Um, I had this really awesome activity. It was like a multi-day activity we did in a college algebra class in a college setting where we would just Google uh, college algebra final exam PDF. And we took the most popular search result and kids looked through it. And this was near the end of the course. And there were some things they knew how to answer and some they didn't. But we just did a little breakdown into like, what's this thing really asking and what's it really testing, right? So the framing of the test was about, you know, no notes, no hate, no calculators, a pencil and nothing else, I think was the direct quote from the instructions. And then there was one question that had some obscure factorization problem with another question that asked them for the solutions of some equation involving a radical and 
I think anybody would look at it and many groups of teachers I've talked to and worked with have looked at it and said, looks like a pretty straightforward pre-calculus or college algebra exam. But there's so many things it's testing and so many things that are not being tested. If you're giving a review, is it similar? Or is that really preparing kids to know things or are they just learning how to replicate when they see certain things? And so, you know, when we open up our way of doing it, like opening up a graphing calculator to go with the question or ask some deeper thinking questions or make them a little bit more open-ended and ask them some what ifs, we get a whole different window into what students know and what they understand, where they're at and where they can go than just stock closed answers on a traditional test. So like Joshua said, it's a, it's a good measure for doing a certain thing. It's not the only measure for all the things that we want to know. Yeah, you know, I think like I said, you have to kind of know your audience. I mean, you know, we're not going to, you know, one thing I've learned in many years of education is we're not going to preach to every choir. So, you know, I, I've learned to, you know, put put my, you know, my eggs and my energy into those people who are, because again, unfortunately, we have a lot of colleagues who are just not interested. You know, but a lot of people are very invested in this, you know, and I, again, when, to be very honest, like when people give me that whole college speech, that kind of is one of my bigger turnoffs. Like when it's like when I realize I'm speaking to, you know, a brick wall, because even that that kind of, you know, far off gazing way of looking at the college experience is, is, is wrong in definition for that exact reason. Because like you said, there are various disciplines and none of those that none of those share a commonality as far as what proficiency in that looks like. So, you know, I think it's it's it is it's rooted in inequity. It's rooted in we want this elitist, you know, thing that you are, we're constantly this bar that we're moving away from you. And I just, I don't, I don't see the, the benefit in that, you know, we're, we're, we're not look, you know, we're looking at kids who are not, and again, what are we preparing them for? Because even, like I said, we look at colleges, how do we adequately, how do we talk about in four or five years, we have kids that are looking at certifications in these, you know, in cybersecurity that are no longer interested in that college experience. So once that mystique goes away, how do you validate the learning? And I think that's unfortunately where the college piece has come in. It hasn't been to really look at inquiry and, and and deeper understanding. And, you know, it's become this like, this is how we keep moving this bar. This is how we keep making it elite. This is how we keep moving it away from the masses. And it's like, it's, it's, it's outdated, you know, but all that to say, a lot of our colleagues, you know, and I realize again, my, my business is children. I'm not, you know, I, I would love to have like-minded people who thought, the same way, but if I'm the only person and I've been in schools where that's happened, you know, my, my job is to close my door. I think that's one of the great things about coming from a, you know, veteran educator, you know, being raised by uh, several veteran educators, you know, um, but being able to say like, you know, you, that it's your classroom, you know, you, you hold it down. And if, you know, it, it's great to have people who, who think like you, but that's not what you're here to do. I think, can I mention something, Nolan? You mentioned a very good thing of like addressing what they are afraid of. And the naysayers often speak from fear. And and if we don't address what they're afraid of and get them to put words on that, then we can't show them how even our method would solve that. So I first try to actually, I forgot, I do try to have compassion because most of the people that are teaching in a traditional way are just trying to survive. You know, you got 30 I could have 185 students. I don't this year. I only have 120 students, which is different for our demographic. But I could have 185 students. How would I give five-minute interviews? How would I give updates of portfolios, you know, for all semester long when I could do a, a uh, my open math assignment? I could do, you know, a con assignment. I could have all these other edulastic things that will do these assessments and give feedback. So we have to address their their fears and their real concerns and have compassion for them because that's why they're clinging to these methods of assessment because they work for them too, you know, and they, they don't see more. So I think if you could like get into helping them see the other ways and that they're not going to be swamped with work, like by grading less, you actually make your work more meaningful, you know, by not by not putting points on everything, by... By having a discussion, you make that interaction more meaningful than what's a, what's a 16 out of 20. You know, like, I, I don't know what a 16, like, what does that tell me? What ideas do they know? What ideas they don't know? And it's like, they shot the, hit the target 16 out of 20 times. Like, not why did they miss or did the wind cause them or, you know, it, I, don't, I think that they could then come to understand that they would get more meaning for what they really want if they could just take that leap and pass what they're afraid of. And so... If we don't if we don't come at them with compassion, then we also won't remember that 
they're products of the system that that they went through. So, and it won't work. And on that note, I think that will conclude our questioning round. We will now end by giving each speaker two minutes to make their final arguments to you. And we will begin with Coach Hicks. Coach Hicks, floor is yours. Awesome. So again, I just would love to um, reiterate the uh, the success and the the growth I've really seen from my students um, in project based learning. Um, I've again been around the barn a few times in the educational field um, and really looked at some best practices, and I've uh, been most pleased uh, with what my students have been able to uh, not only show me what they've learned, but also at the same time develop very positive learning skills. So I think again as we are assessing students, wanting them to be in a space where we're not crushing them um, if they're not able to um, produce in the more traditional um, way that we've used to assess students. So I think um, for me, it definitely speaks to equity. It definitely um, opens the door, connects to a lot of things that I'm passionate about and educated. I'm sure many of our listeners, um, again, as we one of my brothers so eloquently said, you know, if they're listening to this, they're looking at alter, alternative ways at at getting students to develop that understanding. And I really, really would say that project-based learning is one of those ways. Um, but again, not, I don't think it is uh, in spite of either of the the wonderful um, solutions. I think just, again, within the first two minutes of the conversation, um, I saw ways where that Venn diagram, that those, where those circles intertwine um, between project-based learning and interviewing and, you know, and the portfolio base and looking at, you know, those particular group of students, the unit, what uh, those, the understanding that you're trying to have your students demonstrate, um, and how do you use, you know, the smorgasbord or the, you know, the buffet of a little bit of all of that, you know, and 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 again, you know, looking at those individual group of students or your particular content area, um, of course, one may be a little bit heavier, but I would think, like I said, both all of what, what we're talking about really kind of speaks, I think, more so just if looking at from the project based learning unit being the method. Um, and then what Nolan and Joshua both talked about are kind of the ways of demonstrating that understanding. So I don't think any of the three methods, thankfully, in today's conversation are a either or. It's just how do you fit all three pieces to demonstrate um, understanding in an alternative way? Thank you. And next we'll hear from Joshua B. Joshua, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. First of all, um, if you're wondering about interviewing, you should try it. You should. Give it a shot. If not, even as something for the whole class, just with some five, 10 individuals. Set out a set of open-ended questions that can be covered in an entire unit that can go lots of different directions. Have some baseline, kind of beginning, middle, and more advanced sort of topics. Allow for multiple ways of representing things and allow for yourself to listen to the student. This is really the fundamental aspect of being a teacher is a relationship. Without a student, if, without a teacher, there's no student teaching relationship. That's not to say learning can occur on its own without a teacher. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. But as we are teachers, we want to foster that relationship. And so once you enter into this and you open yourself up, you'll discover the students are going to bring with you things you could have never thought they needed to work on or ways that they see that you would have never thought. So. The world of like mystery and discovery and authentic like one-on-one -on -one connection lies there for the interview process. If you want to then codify it and give them sort of levels like a standard that they've met, create a rubric and check some boxes off. Uh, but ultimately, it's about getting them to speak math with you and being mathematical and having that mathematical relationship between you and then coming up with ways of helping them learn more, seeing that they've learned and moving on. So I I hope that this has brought you into it. I do see it as very complimentative of the other methods. And I love our Venn diagram here together. So uh, thank you very much. And just take the risk. You'll find that um, it's fun to talk to your students about math. It's really fun. Thank you, Joshua. And the last, but most certainly not least, uh, Nolan, go ahead. Thanks, Jalen. Yeah, I'll reiterate what Joshua said. If you're thinking about portfolios, give it a try. You can literally add it into whatever you're currently doing without supplanting anything. My hope is that we'll all be a little more reflective of our, our career practices and see what's accomplishing the goals we want and what's sort of just something that's maybe a legacy practice that isn't really giving us what we want, but give it a try. 
Um, two things that I've really been happy about with the use of portfolios, even though I still have a lot of things to keep work, working on and tightening up. Number one is that they give my students an opportunity to become more independent, more self-reliant, and more self-affirming. Um, students are learning the value of collecting artifacts that meet certain standards. Um, some artifacts are there to showcase something they did really well. Some are there to showcase a place they've struggled. Some are there to showcase a role in an individual activity, but some are there to showcase work done in collaboration. So a lot of those different aspects of the things I want students to be doing as learners, I can pull those into a portfolio in a way that I can't get from a traditional kind of test or quiz. Um, the other thing is, Including a portfolio component in my assessment has changed the way I think about curriculum instruction. It's taken me beyond thinking just about standards and skills that I want students to be good at and focusing a lot more on activities and situations and circumstances where students can be thinking about themselves as learners, can be working on growing their identities if those have been harmed, being more metacognitive in their learning process and sort of learning to learn, which is something that um, several of my colleagues have talked about as one of the things that our students in this post-pandemic era are struggling the most with is learning how to learn. So um, I think it's worth a try. Wonderful. Thank you all. And that concludes this Venn diagram debate here on assessment. You give us so much to think about. Thank you all. I hope this gives teachers out there some good food for thought, some good uh, starting like ideas or arguments of why they should get started on maybe one of these paths they've been thinking about it. And now it's up to our listeners to take a moment, honor the arguments, share with friends and colleagues and consider what resonated with you. Maybe even try one of these things. Reach out to these uh, three gentlemen and, and see how you can fit it into your classroom. Be sure to go to our Twitter at debate math pod to share your thoughts on this debate. What assessments do you use as alternatives to your traditional tests? And again, big thanks to our three guests here. You are all thoughtful and you saw, you know, uh, connections to each other and, you, and they highlighted each other while also sharing the great ideas you have about assessment in, in your style as well. And thank you to all those who are listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed and learned from this episode. I can't wait to you know, join in this learning again with you soon. And as we wrap up, if people want to find you all, let's start with Coach Hicks. Where can people find you? We are at All Things Coding with Culture. So our website, uh, codingwithculture.com, uh, all socials except Twitter. So everything is coding with culture spelled out, no spaces. Twitter, um, due to characters, is coding W. So just abbreviate the width. But yeah, I would love to hear from people. Let me know what you need and, you know, reach out, email, text, any good things. Uh, Joshua, where can listeners find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Mr. Joshua Bean. And also you can email me if you'd like. Uh, is it okay if I get my email, by the way? Uh, so my email is wakingbean at gmail.com. So if you'd like to, please reach out. You know, this is the way that I met Nolan. It's the way I got turned on to Chris's CMC conferences. And it's great to have a community of people that want to explore ideas. And the more that we discuss, the more that people see that they can take these leaps. And so if you want to continue this growth, just please reach out to me. I'd love to communicate. And Nolan, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Nolan Fossum or uh, by email at nolanfossummass at gmail.com. Wonderful. Thank you all. Want to learn more about incorporating debate activities into your math classroom? Go to lozniak.com slash podcast to sign up for my mailing list and get your first set of example debate activities you could use with your students today. Go to lesniak.com slash podcast. Don't forget to reach out to us with comments and questions on debatemath.com or follow us on Twitter at debatemathpod and follow along with hashtag debatemathpod. Rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this podcast. Your feedback is super important to us. Well, that's all from us. Looking forward to debating with you more next episode. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.